Hello again and thank you for joining me for this another meditation on the tabernacle. We're on the second series now and we're looking at the responsibilities of the Kohathites and today we're going to have a look at the laver. For our Bible reading let's go to Exodus chapter 30 verses 17 through to 21. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass and his foot also of brass to wash withal and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water, that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offerings made by fire unto the Lord. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, that they die not. And it shall be a statute for ever to them even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. And a further reading in Exodus chapter 38 verse 8, And he made the laver of brass and the foot of it of brass of the looking glasses of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And as always we know that God is pleased to bless to us the readings from his most holy precious word. Here then is our artist's impression of what the tabernacle might have looked like from the outside. I say again, as I've done on previous meditations, that the slides that are used in this presentation are from free Bible images and the author and the details are shown at the end of this presentation. Here is a plan of the tabernacle showing the area covered blue, which is the outer court and the item to which the arrow points, the laver that we're looking at this week. There to the right of our picture is an artist's impression what the laver might have looked like. And you'll notice from the next slide, it's somewhat different to that artist's impression. And the reason is that we have no real details about the laver as to its dimensions, where there was a trough of water at the top for the hands and a trough of water at the bottom for the feet that we're not too sure of. And as to its height, and its diameter on all those details, we're left without any precise instructions. We're not even told the weight of this item like we have been told on some others where we have no dimensions, but that will just be sufficient for now just to know where the laver was located. Just behind the altar there as you came in on the east gate, you would pass the altar, then come to the laver before going into that front door into the holy place. Here is another artist's impression of what the laver might have looked like. However, before I start saying any more details about the laver, you might have noticed that I didn't read the traditional verses that I have been reading in this series so far from Numbers chapter 3, verses 29 and 31. There was a deliberate reason for that, inasmuch as those verses don't specifically mention that the laver was Kohathite responsibility. In fact, I've searched the scriptures from beginning to end to try and find any reference as to who might have had responsibility for this item, and the scripture is absent of any details as to who precisely had the responsibility. Myself, I feel that it, it probably was Kohathite responsibility in as much as it fits that all the other vessels were their responsibility, and so that's why I'm including it in this series. I've mentioned already that there are no details as to the measurements or weight given to this item. And before I move off that subject, I'm going to suggest that the absence of these details might suggest that there is no limit to the holiness that God would require of his people. I'm reminded of the words of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 16. It is written, be ye holy for I am holy. The practical details of this vessel are clear from the readings that we've had. They were for the officiating priests to wash their hands and their feet at this item before they would go to the brazen altar to offer sacrifices there or to go through the door of the tabernacle into the holy place, which they did daily, either to dress the lamps, uh, to offer incense on the incense altar 
or to attend to the table of showbread, which they did once each week, before any priest went through that door or offer sacrifice at the altar, they would come here first to wash their hands and their feet. And that gives us the important truth that God would have those that participate in his service to be holy. I remind you of those words again of 1 Peter 1 verse 16, Be ye holy, for I am holy. The general teaching of this item would be Christ and the believer's sanctification. That word sanctification literally means being set apart as clean unto God. The material brass we have seen in the brazen altar already and in that respect we saw it as the metal that withstood the heat of the fire. It was that which most resisted the heat and here in this item where there's no fire applied clearly, but it would again suggest to us that for those priests personally, sin was judged. And we can see the lesson to ourselves as priests before God, that is if we're believers on the Lord Jesus, we're all constituted priests, both holy priests to offer sacrifice and worship and royal priest to show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his most marvelous light. But whichever part of priesthood we're engaged in, either in the matters of worship or service, then again the lesson applies that sin must be judged before we participate in any service for him. I read that additional verse from Exodus chapter 38 verse 8 because it explains to us where the brass came from for this item to be made and that was a very interesting subject in itself. It was from the women who brought of their material things for the use in the tabernacle. They would surrender their looking at glasses, literally their mirrors that they looked to behold themselves in. They surrendered them to the production of this item. There's one thing that we know about a mirror and that is when we look at it we see ourselves as we really are. The only problem is that the mirror in itself is powerless to do anything about what the mirror reveals. So these mirrors of the women would have probably been used that they might exalt the flesh, see what needed to be improved and so they might improve it themselves to look the more beautiful. However, it reminds us of a very important lesson. This brass now had to be converted into a laver with water at the base for the washing of the feet and the water for the washing of the hands. It is, as this water would speak of, representative of the word of God and is the word of God that is able to cleanse a sinner from their evil way as the lovely chapter of the word of God, Psalm 119, reveals to us. What we'll appreciate about this laver is that it speaks to us about the washing of water by the word. And the word of God truly is a mirror. It shows us ourselves as we are. But unlike the brass polished mirrors that the women used in the tabernacle days, those mirrors were unable to change them, whereas the word of God is able to cleanse from all defilement and all that would mar and all that would hinder and spoil. So let us be sure again that this labour is very important. It shows to us the lesson that flesh cannot please God. It has to be judged and all that is defiling must be cleansed. We might ask where is it in scripture that we see this lesson that the water represents the word of God. I'll draw your attention to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26. And here the Apostle Paul, as he writes the Ephesians, talks about that fact that men ought to love their wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And it speaks about that church that is sanctified, set apart. And of that church, he writes in Ephesians 5 verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And the living water sets forth the Spirit of God as the Lord Jesus sets out in John chapter 7 verses 38 
and 39 where it reads, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. To summarise then, the water in this vessel, the laver, represents two things. Firstly, the word of God is seen in Ephesians 5 verse 26. And secondly, the spirit of God as seen in John chapter 7 verses 38 and 39. One thing I want you to notice, however, and that is this, that the priests that came to this laver for washing had already been washed all over. You'll read about their washing all over in Exodus chapter 29, verse 4. And that washing all over was never repeated again, just like our initial washing at conversion. As Titus 3 verse 5 tells us, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. We never need to be saved again. Salvation is a once for all act, never to be repeated again. The new birth sanctifies us, cleanses us, sets us apart for God as holy. And that is a thing that we enjoy positionally at the new birth. However, practically, as we live and move through a dirty, sin, sick, sad world, we as the people of God get dirty. Our hands get dirty with the things that we handle. Our feet get dirty by the places our feet sometimes go where they ought not to go. And so there's that constant daily, several times a day need as we realise that we've sinned against God and done things that are contrary to his word and to his ways, then we should confess our sins so that we are in a position to be practically righteous before God, just as we are positionally righteous with God. The Lord Jesus summarised this, you know, in a very beautiful way, as John 13 recalls for us that lovely instant when the Lord Jesus took the towel and the bowl and went round each of the disciples and washed them. And you'll remember that when he got to Peter, he said these words, He that is washed. Now that word washed there means literally bathed all over. That would be a picture to us of the new birth. He that is washed, bathed all over, needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. That second washing that the Lord Jesus speaks to Peter about has to do with mat the matter of practical sanctification, as we've been seeing, as we've studied this labour together, being of clean hands and clean feet. Note, however, the Lord Jesus doesn't speak about washing uh, Peter's hands. He just speaks about washing his feet. But we know that both hands and feet get dirty as we travel through this world and there's the need for that daily cleansing. That would just like the practical dirt that the people of that day, when the Lord Jesus spoke to Peter, would have encountered as they had their shoes open and walked the dusty streets and lanes of Galilee and Judea. Those feet would get dirty and they would need to be washed and they would washed that was a tradition that they carried out. They would wash the hands and the feet of the visitors to the houses so that as they sat down to enjoy fellowship with the host, they would be clean without defilement. And so must we as we engage in worship and service for our blessed Master. I conclude with this final slide and as indicated earlier, Two sets of free Bible images have been used in this presentation and the authors are shown there. Until next time, when we have another meditation, this will be the last in this current series and it will be our meditation of the veil. Until then, may God bless you and look forward to meeting you again soon in the Lord's will.